represents is patriarchy. We're here to do work as men, as patriarchs. There's nothing more natural than being a father. Welcome back to 21 Patriarch. Our next speaker is from New Zealand. Uh, he lives here in America and is helping us fight a major battle that we're in as a country. Uh, he is a, a documentary filmmaker. He's a contributor for one of my favorite uh, news sources, the Epoch Times. Uh, he is an expert on Marxism, socialism, and a lot of the other evil isms. Will you please welcome Trevor Loudon? Trevor. Thank you, sir. Hi, everybody. Can you all hear me down the back okay? Yes, sir. Good. Can you understand the southern accent? <laughs> I hope you can. That always worries me. Um, I'll just start, Reagan says you should always start with a story. Anybody, uh, any refugees from California here today? Yeah. yeah, okay, a few of you. You made a good decision. I was in Los Angeles, and I love street food, so I walk up to a vendor, and I, he gave me the food, gave me the change, and said, hey, um, you have an accent. Where are you from? I said, well, I'm from New Zealand. So he said, well, where's that? So to make it really simple for him, I said, look, it's down in the South Pacific near Australia. He said, ah, where Arnold Schwarzenegger comes from. <laughs> so you can understand why they vote like they do out there, right? <laughs> now, people ask me all the time, because I tour all over America. My subject is mainly communism, socialism, and its impact on mainstream politics. And people ask me all the time, why, as a New Zealander, I should care about what happens in this country? And I say, it's really simple. It's, the first reason is simple gratitude. You know, my country was facing invasion during World War II by the Imperial Japanese Army. And if it hadn't been for the sacrifice of your fathers and uncles and grandfathers at the battles of Guadalcanal and the Coral Sea and Midway, we would have been toast. And that's still a memory in my country today. And the second reason is related, but a little more selfish. You know, Ronald Reagan had it right. This is the last best hope for mankind. If this country loses its constitution, its liberty, its economic dynamism, and its military superiority, all of which are under huge threat right now, we'll soon be living in a world run out of Moscow and Beijing and Tehran and Havana. And do you know any men or any women who'd like to leave their children to a world like that? So anybody who cares about liberty has to care about this country. But I want to talk today, start today, with a love story. And it's not your typical Romeo and Juliet type of thing. <coughs> but I think it's telling of where we are as a society today. I've got a friend who was a top general in Delta Force. He's got bullet wounds here, he's got bullet wounds here. He's led his men into combat many times. He sacrificed a lot for this country. But a few years ago, he had to make one of the bravest decisions of his life. And it was right here in this country. And there was nobody shooting at him, but it took a lot of courage. So he had a 16-year-old son, and the son was smoking dope every single day. Now, this is a very strong Christian family, and this was upsetting the family, creating a lot of tension, a lot of arguments. And there was, this was going on for months and months, and Dad would say, Son, you've got to stop smoking this crap. And they said, If you don't stop smoking this, I'm going to have to kick you out of the house. And of course, Mother would say, No, no, we can't do that. We can't kick him out. We've got to get him through this. We've got to help him and be supportive. We've got to get him through this. Well, one day, Dad just got sick of it. So he picks up the son, puts him in the back of the car, and takes him down to the local shopping mall and says, Son, out. This is your home until you start to learn to love your family more than you love marijuana. Bye. And he drove away from there praying all the way home and choking back tears. This very brave 
soldier. Five days late, five days they heard nothing. Five horrible days. They heard nothing. The fifth day they get a knock on the door. And here's Junior saying, Dad, can I please come home? I'm never going to smoke that junk again. And he came home and he kept his word. And now he's doing pretty darn well. Married, has a business, has family. Everything's gone right. But the point I'm getting at here, folks, is there is two kinds of love. We all know the love of the mother. We all need that, you know. She'll pick you up when you skin your knees. She'll put a bandage on it. She'll read your stories. She'll, she'll bake cookies for you. She'll always she'll go to your graduation. She's always going to be there for you. And we all know that every family needs that. But there's also the love of the father who will boot your little backside if you disrespect your mother, who will hold you to account, who will take his son to the ball game, out fishing or to the woodshed if necessary, who will teach his son to be a man, who will protect his siblings, respect his mother and be a guardian to those weaker than himself. And he will teach his daughter to be a lady, to respect herself and look for a man as least as good as he is. That is, we all know, folks, that the ideal family has both elements. You have the feminine love, you have the masculine love. And together, they give any child the best possible chance for the future. Because, but we all know that masculine love has been heavily, heavily denigrated in our society. You know, it's not something to be proud of. It's not something that's even acknowledged. We know that virtually every advertisement you see on TV is some stupid man being corrected by either his children or his wife. You know, masculine love is what stormed the beaches at Normandy. Masculine love is what built this country. It's the people who went out and conquered the frontier, built universities, built churches, built cities. That's masculine love. And it is absolutely essential for any functioning society. Every family needs it. Every church needs it. Every community needs it. It's absolutely essential. We were designed a certain way. There's feminine attributes, and this masculine attributes. And ideally, they synthesize and the sum, the whole is the greater than the part, you know, the sum of the parts. So what happened? Well, a lot of it's to do with religion, I think. Now, if you go to most churches in America today, the favorite word is love. It's beyond virtually the only thing they talk about a lot of the time. Love, Jesus loves you, you've got to love your neighbor, you've got to love everybody, and it's pretty unconditional love. What, what do you think is the dominant form of love in most churches today? Masculine or feminine? Feminine by a country mile. Where's the old priests in the Catholic church who used to take the young boys out back, put boxing gloves on them, and teach them how to box? The old priest had served in the Korean War in World War II or Vietnam. Where is the, the pastor who would preach a sermon that would chill your blood, that would look directly into you and hold you to account so you felt like you're in a cold shower, you were trembling most of the way through it? You know, because Christianity used to be a very masculine religion. You know, Jesus didn't go into the temple and say, can we please negotiate a settlement, guys? He went in and turned the damn tables over. He didn't say, go for, he, he said, go forth and sin no more, not do what you like, I'll set it right with dad. It was a very strong religion. You know, the, the hymns reflected that onward Christian soldiers marching as to war. That's not the kind of hymn you hear in most Christian churches today. You're most likely going to go to church with a pastor wearing skinny jeans, a wispy beard, a little bit long around the edges, 
who's going to take you to his coffee shop and, you know, just nurture you a little bit and be nice to you. You'll never, ever be held to account. You'll never hear anything out of the Old Testament. You'll never hear, you know, anything about sin or hell or redemption. You'll hear a lot about love, a lot about welcoming refugees, global warming, social justice, critical race theory, and all of that Marxist crap. That is the dominant Christianity in America today. And so why is our society like it is? You know, we were given three institutions, really, to govern ourselves. You know, from a Christian point of view, we were given the church, we were given the family, we were given civil government. And for 2,000 years, the church was the leading moral authority. And the church was very masculine. The church upheld the masculine values. It expected people to fight for their communities. It expected men to be the leaders of their household. And if you had a man in your community who was beating his wife, you would find some men who would go around and give him a bit of a tickle up and tell him to sort his act out. That was the kind of Christianity that built this country. It was a lot more masculine than the Christianity we see today. Well, has anybody heard the concept situation ethics? Situation ethics. It's a dominant moral system in our country today. You know, the old system used to be, everybody would reference the Ten Commandments. I'm talking the Judeo-Christ, you know, Judeo-Christ, you know, obviously there are Buddhists, there are the people that weren't brought up in that tradition. But that was the dominant moral system of America. Everybody looked to the Ten Commandments. You might have been the biggest drunk in town. You might have been a philanderer and a petty thief or whatever, but at least you knew you were sinning. At least you knew that there were certain commandments that you were supposed to live by. Even if you didn't live them, you knew what they were. Well, and this was the dominant moral system for many, many years in America. And as we know, religion is the father of culture. Culture is the father of politics. You know, your religion affects your culture. Your culture affects the politics. So if your politics is a sewer and your culture is in massive decline, what is that telling you about your spiritual foundations? Is there a bit of an indication that they may not be sound? Well, Joseph Fletcher came along in 1966. He was a, a, the leading Protestant theologian of the early 20th century in America. Respected all over the world, wrote dozens of books, lectured all over the world. He was at uh, the Episcopalian Divinity School at Harvard, etc., he was a real moral arbiter in this country in the first half of the, in the middle of the 20th century, effectively. In 1966, he writes, writes this book. It's called Situation Ethics. And this is what he says. Forget the Old Testament. Forget all those strict commandments. They are not suitable for, the, for, for modern life. Modern life is way more complex. Instead, if you want to make moral decisions, you look at the situation around you, you look at the circumstances, and then you make the decision based on love. Now, what kind of love do you think he was referencing there? The masculine, tough kind of love? Or more the wimpy type, you know, let's eat everything, you know, the more flexible kind of love? What, what do you think he was referencing? But I can tell you it was more the, the feminine side of love, absolutely. So this is how it would work. Say you're a, say you've got a family and, you, and you, you, you love your family, but you've got no job and you've got no money. And your kids are crying, they're hungry. So if you're using situation ethics, you could go down to the local supermarket and steal some stuff. That would be morally justified under situation ethics because love is the final arbiter not law love you could be a young girl in college you know try and imagine i'm a young girl in college right you know why shouldn't i be 
You know, it's, it's fair enough, isn't it? You're a young girl in college. You're just starting. Your, you're, near, you're nearly you're near the end of your degree. You get pregnant. The guy's not around. You're thinking, oh, you know, I've got a baby inside me. I can't really give that baby the kind of love and family that it needs. You know, the guy's not around. He's not going to help me. He's not going to support me. Um, I'm near the end of my degree. When I get my degree, I'll be earning lots of money. And if I have future children, I'll be able to provide for them. Maybe the most loving thing to do is to have an abortion. And you could justify that on situation ethics because you're looking at your situation and you are the moral arbiter based on what you think is the most loving thing to do. You can see how flexible that could get. You can justify almost anything. You're in a big company. The boss, you hate him. Why shouldn't you embezzle half a million dollars and give it to a, your family or your favorite charity? Because he is a total jerk. And it's real loving. I could, you know, I could have some holidays and I get, treat my family and I give some to charity. And Situation ethics ju justifies almost anything. Well, this book transformed American Christianity and American society. It's now the dominant moral system in this country right now. Don't believe me. You just observe how things go around you. you know, people who defraud the insurance companies, the people who you know, punch the time clock at work when they shouldn't have really punched the time clock, the pastor who won't preach the truth, he just wants to preach a watered-down version of the gospel because he doesn't want to drive all his people away because that would be too harsh and it wouldn't be the loving thing to do. That's all situation ethics. You know, if you don't accept that, if you, if you believe in the, old, in the Ten Commandments, you don't lie. You don't lie, period. You don't justify your lies because it's a really loving thing to do. You don't justify adultery because you really love this woman over here and you really don't like your wife too much. You know, you set your rules, you set your boundaries, and you live by them. And if you make a decision, you know why you make that decision. So Joseph Fletcher, when he was a young man, he went to Berkeley. And Berkeley was very conservative in those days. But he got kicked out of Berkeley because part of the degree, part of the requirement to become uh, to graduate from Berkeley in those days is you had to do ROTC. You had to put on a uniform and practice with guns to graduate from Berkeley. And that was common through universities all over the country. And he refused. He was a pacifist. So he didn't graduate. He went to Alabama, worked with the Sharecroppers Union, went to Cincinnati, worked with a whole bunch of communist fronts in Cincinnati, went to Divinity College, got ordained worked his way up through the uh, Christian academic hierarchy of Boston. He was a member of the World Peace Council, a Soviet front run by Stalin to basically push for U.S. demilitarization so the communists could take this country down. He was a leader of the American Soviet Friendship Society. He was identified under oath as a Communist Party supporter in Harvard over several years. He wrote his book, Transformed American Christianity, dropped out of the church, declared himself an atheist, and started a group advocating for post-birth abortion, abortion, meaning infanticide, for intellectually handicapped children up to 10 years old. It will not surprise you, he also worked with Margaret Sanger to set up Planned Parenthood. Of the abortion movement is a communist movement, folks. It has been run by communists since day one. It was the Socialist Workers' Party that helped to get Roe v. Wade passed in 1973. Abortion was then and still is a communist movement. Absolutely. But so Fletcher was a communist. He was never a Christian, but he transformed the church. Could he have done that if you were standing in the middle of Times Square with a big hammer and sickle armband? 
Or did it take the respectability of the church to get his message out there? Well, that is the American church today, folks. You have a church that is woke. There's a direct connection from the Marxists of the 1920s who deliberately infiltrated the American church. The Communist Party told their members in the 1920s, if you're brought up Baptist, go back to the Baptists. If you're brought up Mormon, go back to the Latter-day Saints. If you're brought up Jewish, go back to the synagogue. If you're brought up Catholic, go back to the church. Not that they wanted their people to become Christian or Jewish or Mormon. They just wanted to influence the church because they knew the backbone of this country was the church, the masculine church. And they knew if they wanted to destroy this country, they had to A, feminize the church and B, and B socialize the church, move it to the left. And the modern woke movement which is all through the evangelical churches now, it's all through the Baptist churches even, is moving the American church way to the left and it has feminized the church beyond all recognition. Yes, there are some good pastors left. Yes, there's some independents there, you know, who stand up for what they were taught, what they actually believe. But most churches today have adopted some element of the wokeness. Most of them are pretty darn feminine, and very few of them hold anybody to account or talk about sin or redemption or accountability at all. The Old Testament's virtually been abolished. And here's a point. They talk about love. In the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, do you know how many times the love of God are mentioned in those four Gospels? One time, one verse, and but that is the only verse, you know, for man, for God so loved man, he gave his own, you know, only son. That's the only time. Really, it is, should be, and always was, all about the law. Law comes before love. If you cannot obey God's law, you shouldn't be getting God's love. If you cannot obey man's law, you're not fit for civil society. If you can't keep your agreements with your wife, if you can't keep your business agreements, if you can't follow the law, you are not a man. Law comes before love. And law has been abolished in the churches and it is being abolished in our society. So who has been doing this, folks? As I said, Joseph Fletcher was a big part of it, an undercover communist. The communists put all their people back into the churches in the 20s. By the 1930s, they had control of most of the mainstream churches, Episcopalian, Methodist, etc. They joined them up into the National Council of Churches, which was affiliated with the World Council of Churches, which was run by the Soviet KGB. There's a direct line, but a lot of people left the mainstream churches. They either left Christianity altogether or they went into the evangelical movement. Well, and the evangelical movement was what was behind electing Ronald Reagan and to a large degree, Donald Trump. Now you think, if the left has control of Hollywood, control of the Democratic Party, control of part of the Republican Party, control of the education system, and the judiciary, and most of the media, but these crazy Christians, evangelicals, go out and vote for Ronald Reagans and Donald Trumps, who then set their agenda back about 10 years. You think that made the left happy? So there's been a big push in the last 10 years through the Gospel Coalition, Tim Keller and others, Sojourners, Jim Wallace, all connected back to the communist movement of the 30s and 40s, direct connections to bring Marxism into the evangelical churches and the Baptists. And now the, now the, the Southern Baptists, the, the, the so-called very straight Bible-believing, you know, they don't allow women preachers, all this kind of thing. Well, that's going to be going pretty soon. You know, they, they preach against homosexuality. That's almost gone. 
Even these churches now are feminized and socialized. So this is affecting the culture, it's affecting the politics, and it doesn't leave a masculine man very many places to go for a bit of spiritual help, for a bit of spiritual connection. So there's been a war on masculinity because there's been a war on America. The Soviets, now the Chinese communists, understood they could never take America unless they weakened America first. And believe me, folks, the goal of communism has never wavered. It is world domination. It cannot exist any other way. I had a friend who trained in Moscow in the 80s. You know, he trained as a communist in Lenin's Institute for Higher Learning. Three and a half thousand students there at any one time, learning racial agitation, unionism, feminism, learning all of this stuff. 3,000 people there, and they were told by the Soviet tutors back then, socialism doesn't work. It's a mess. It doesn't work. It will only work when we have the whole world under our control and then we can abolish the wage system worldwide. Then everybody will be dependent on us. Then it will work. So we sort of thought, well, the Soviet Union had a bit of a setback, so we didn't have to worry about this stuff. So we all took our eye off the ball and now China's about to clean our clock with Russian help, by the way. You know, the Chinese Navy's five times bigger than America's Navy now. They've just launched a missile that can fly twice around the world before it hits its target. They've got more men under arms than we have. And what about our men? They're getting ready for war. Our soldiers are getting ready for mascara. You know, what's Biden doing right now? He's purging every patriot. He's purging every Trump supporter every conservative, every Christian he can find, because he is working for the other side, folks. Absolutely he is. His whole family's been working for Moscow or Tehran or Beijing since 1972, people. You know, you look at that thing in Afghanistan. What a big mistake, Afghanistan. How could anybody be so stupid as to bring all the troops out while you've still got thousands of people on the ground? How could anybody be so incompetent? Biden is incompetent, but do you think Susan Rice and Barack Obama and the Chinese who run him, do you think they're incompetent? They just told the whole world that America can no longer be trusted, that America can't protect its allies, that it's no use working for America because they'll sell you out straight away. That's what that was about. That gave a whole bunch of arms to America's enemies. It gave China a free pass on its western front. If China wanted to attack the Pacific, they had this big fat American airbase right on their western flank, well, it would have been a problem. Well, that ain't a problem anymore because they own it now. So we are being set up for revolution. But I get off the topic a little bit because you guys are here because this is a conference about men and masculinity and the attacks on men and masculinity. So it surprises me, it shocks me deeply when I say things like, you know the feminist movement is communist, don't you? And people go, what, really? Re really? Are you, are you serious? You know the LGBTQ movement, that's communist. You do know that, right? What, really? No, can't be. Well, what, what do you mean? So what is communism? See, many people on our side think communism is just an economic system. It's where the government takes over the means of production and it can be defeated by better economics. We'll just show them a better system and the people will vote with their feet. And we thought we'd won this great victory over Russia and we cheered when, Vietnam, when China started adopting you know, market policies. And Vietnam started adopting market policies. We cheered. We trade with them. We helped them build up their military because we thought communism was finished because we thought communism was an economic system. 
That's only a tiny part of it, people. You look, what, what is communism really? Communism is revolution. What is revolution? Revolution is overturning the existing social order to establish something else. A classless society that tells us, no, it's not. It's overturning the order so that basically Satan can rule the earth. That's what it is. Because we were given the family. We were given the church. We were given civil government. Are all three of those institutions under massive attack right now? The feminist movement is about destroying the family because that's the structure that holds our society together. The Marxists are in the churches because that's our spiritual foundation. The Marxists are in civil government because that's our social order. All of these three things, when the church is strong, the families will be strong and civil government will be kept in its place. When the church has been pushed out of the, to the margins and been feminized and weakened, the families go to hell and the government gets bigger and bigger to take up the surplus, to, to, to fill in the gaps. Is that where we are right now, folks? We are in a revolution now, people. It's feminism. It's the LGBTQ movement. It's the Black Lives Matter movement. It is the environmental movement. It is the movement to stop us being energy independent. It's the anti-military peace movement. All of these things are communism. Communism isn't just an economic system. It is a system of overthrowing every institution we have that keeps us st stable and prosperous and free. It's everything. You know, they learned a long time ago that we, you know, the economics wasn't going to inspire people. You know, a lot of these radical feminists don't care about economics. Black Lives Matter doesn't care about economics. You know, they care about race. The feminists care about gender, gender oppression. The old communist model when they first started was right. It was the working class would overthrow the capitalists. Now it is the women will overthrow the men. The, the, the people, oppressed peoples of colour will overthrow white, white Christian capitalism. The gay movement will overthrow the family. You know, the environmental movement will overthrow the American free market system. All of these are communist movements designed to overthrow the world's greatest republic, the greatest society that's ever been, because if they can overthrow America, no one will stand. And they will have the world communism they've been trying to get since 1848, even before that. Communism's always been with it. It just was called different things. You know, Marx made a pseudoscience out of it. Lenin made a, was a tactician. He worked out how the Marxists could come to power and the, how they could keep power. But the first step was the economic revolution, but that failed. You look at the last attempt at economic revolution in this country, the Occupy movement of 2011, the 99% versus the 1%. That was an economic revolution. But it didn't really go that far, did it? It got a few headlines. It was around for a few months. Then the police broke it up and everything was fine again. But look at Black Lives Matter. It's a Chinese-directed communist operation. Burnt cities all over America. Killed many cops. Did huge damage. But you had churches taking a knee to them. Big corporations giving them lots of money. They have all this respectability. But it's a Chinese communist operation run out of the Chinese consulate in San Francisco. But it's a communist operation. But how many Americans understand that? So if they can't understand Black Lives Matter as a communist operation, when they talk about Marxism openly, how do you think most Americans understand that feminism Feminism is a communist operation. The LGBTQ movement is a communist operation. 
You look at the, you the greats, Gloria Steinem, Betty Friedan. Every one of them was a member of the Communist Party or Democratic Socialists of America. They were all communists. Emmeline Pankhurst, the, the, the great suffragette of the early 20s, who, you know, the suffragettes were throwing themselves under horses to uh, the king's horses in, in Britain, you know, the races to, to show their cause. Emmeline Pankhurst was a Communist Party member. They were all communist folks. All the leaders of the feminist movement were socialists or communists. Not saying they didn't have some grievances. Of course they did. Just like Black Lives Matter has some legitimate grievances. A few. You know, there is some exploitation of people by nasty capitalists sometimes. But if they can't find a legitimate grievance, they'll make one up. Absolutely they'll make one up. So you, you look at the LGBTQ movement, started by a man called Harry Hay. He founded the Mattachine Society in the 1940s in, the, in Los Angeles to advocate, to, to advocate for the rights of... They didn't even have a, a word gay. They didn't even call them homosexuals in those days. They called them things like peculiar, or something like that. But he advocated for that movement. And then he built up a, a movement. And um, he was a member of the Communist Party. But he left the Communist Party, not because he was no longer a communist, because it was embarrassing to the Communist Party to have an open homosexual in their ranks at that time. Because social mores were different. And also they thought any homosexual in the ranks was liable to blackmail by the FBI, and they might come, become an informant against the Communist Party. So he left, but they still called him a friend for many, many years. Then they started, they, they had the Stonewall riots. And, you know, the, the Communists joined straight in on that. ACT UP, a very famous radical communist group. It's run by Liberation Road. It's run by Socialist Workers' Party. All of these movements are communists. In the 1950s, a group, no, 1970s, a group of radical leftists, mainly communists, got themselves entrenched in the American Psychological Association and got the definition of homosexuality changed from a mental disorder to a, just a, a variation, a sexual variation. And that gave the homosexual movement the opportunity to start spreading their tentacles into everything. Homosexuals are 1% to 2% of the population. And I, I got nothing against them. I wish them well, you know. But you'd think they were 50% of the population by the amount of power that they have. They have a hell of a lot more power than most of you guys have. Is that a fair comment? And it comes to uh, the judiciary system. You know how, what, what kind of deal a man gets in the current uh, judiciary system in this country, in the courts, etc. The radical feminists took over the courts. The homosexuals got involved because they are activists. This is all they do all day long. The adoption system. You know, in New Zealand, where I come from, the radical feminists took over the adoption system. We used to have, I think, 12,000 abortions a year and about 4, 000, 4 to 10,000 adoptions a year in New Zealand. The feminists took it over. There's now 100 adoptions a year and 17,000 abortions. The feminists do not want adoption. They do not want kids growing up in good families. They want either abortion or people growing up in welfare families. That is what they want. So... Feminism has been attacking the family and every opportunity they possibly can. Most men are weak and beta. How do you get past this? How do you be a real man? How do you be a husband and a father? That has been where we've dropped the ball as men is because we're too accepting. We're too tolerant. I'm calling for intolerance for evil. We need to be able to properly identify with the definition, what is masculinity? We need men to stand up 
and do heroic things. Building a, a tribe of people who are of like mind, who you can depend on, who will hold you accountable, who will call you on your BS. I call the official tagline for now with 21 Connection is America's last stand for masculinity. Mm -hmm. I think it is. The event and it's as a reflection of the manosphere, really. You come out and you consciously attend and start talking with these people because people who are coming here are coming here to discuss big ideas, important ideas. Not just talking about being masculine, but okay, you've done all this self-development, what are you gonna do with it? And I'm talking the radical mil militant feminism. I'm not talking that your daughter wants to go to college. I want my daughter to have every opportunity she can possibly have. But I do not want the legal system of this country tilted in favour of one sex or another. I do not want men being denigrated in every aspect of culture you can find and the masculine values being drummed out of my kid in school. I'll tell you a little example from New Zealand. This is a few years ago, you know, and we've got this stuff way before you got it. I came to my kid's preschool, and he's four years old at the time, right, my son. He's here today. He's, I'm not sure where he is now. And the teacher came up to me and said, hey, um, James has done something rather inappropriate today. And I was thinking, oh, God, you know, what's he sworn? Has he hit somebody? What's he done? And I said, okay, what did he do? Well, he and another boy got a broomstick. And they were pretending it was a gun. And they were pretending to shoot some of the other people, some of the other kids. I said, yeah? Well, what's the issue? And they said, well, well, no, look, look, this is totally inappropriate. We can't have people, boys, doing violent stuff or pretending to be soldiers or cowboys. We can't have that here. And I said, well, well, how do you deal with that kind of situation? Well, we talk to the boys and we get them to pretend the broomstick is something else. So it's, oh, like, like a bazooka or something. <laughs> and she goes, oh, oh, oh. And I said, well, I'm real pleased to know that my boy is, wants to play with guns. That's, that's good. I'm teaching the right stuff. And we are going to walk out to our car and me and him are going to machine gun each other all the way across the car park. But this is everywhere, folks. Am I lying here? Am I exaggerating? This is destroying our society. Because our society is built for men and women. And men have a very clearly defined role. And they have leadership responsibilities. And they're supposed to protect. They are supposed to be out there protecting and building businesses and and looking after their kids and being a strong role model. Any woman you know wants to really have a husband she doesn't respect, that isn't strong, does any woman really want that? Well, they tell you that, but I really don't think so, because they're not happy when they get it. So, and a woman has a very clearly defined role too. She's the nurturer. I do not want women in combat, folks. I think it's immoral and corrupt. Women are not designed for that. Most men aren't designed for it, people. You know, that's harsh. I remember speaking to a woman who had been in combat. She'd been a turret gunner in Iraq when you weren't even supposed to have them. And that woman was on so many drugs that you wouldn't believe it. Now, men have a hard time with combat. But putting women in combat is evil. It is just not right. And I am disgusted at our Republican leaders who didn't raise a peep when they started talking about drafting women, women in combat, as though this is something good. We should be ashamed of that. Allowing women to go into combat when that is our role. Women have their role and they can overlap a lot. And I'm all about independent women, but there are certain things, people, that that's our job, and there are certain things that's their job. I'm happy they have babies. That's great. I'm happy they can lactate. I've never envied them for that, you know? But I think they are happy that we can fight wars, that we can stand up for them, that we can provide. 
Am I a little bit of a troglodyte here, folks? Well, I'm very proud to be one. Absolutely proud to be one. And we wouldn't be here today as we are even worrying about a conference like this if a whole bunch more of us had been standing up for a whole bunch longer. That's the reality. We let it slide. We let it slide. We let it slide. We made compromises. Well, we'll give them that. We'll compromise here. And now, where are we now? On the verge of losing our country, verge of losing our society. Many of us have already lost our kids. We've lost our families. We're going to lose everything if we don't stand up, people. Because what we are facing is godless communism. There is no question about that. This is in our politics. It's in our culture. It's in our churches. It is destroying the traditional roles of, of our families. It's destroying the foundations of our families. It's destroying masculinity. Because if you want to take down a country, you don't really have to demoralize the women that much. It's the men you have to demoralize. It's the men you have to demasculinize. It's the men you have to turn from soldiers into wimps. You know, as you say, how many of the snowflakes today would you feel comfortable charging to storm the beaches at Normandy? You know, and I'm not blaming them. They're brought up in a culture that doesn't value masculinity. Many of them don't have fathers in the family. They don't know what a man is. I I got a friend in Australia. He was an Australian Army sergeant. And they had to tone down the induction. You know, you, you know, when you, you know what you call it here, um, boot camp. You know, when the sergeant swears at you and kicks you and forces you to swim through swamps and run around the parade ground with your gun over your head and he does it endlessly. Well, I had to tone it down, tone it way down because the boys were crying. The boys would start crying because they'd never had... They'd never been yelled at by a man in their life. Many of these young boys had never been yelled at. They'd never been in a fight with another boy. They'd never had to put themselves in any real physical danger. And this was, this was 20 years ago in Australia, which is a pretty macho sort of country, generally speaking, comparatively speaking. But so this is communism. It's taken us down on every single front. And we have to name it for what it is. We are not, you know, imagine trying to fight World War II if you couldn't talk about Nazis. You know, just those German extremists over there. You know? Well, we've got to acknowledge where we are. There is a great spiritual power in acknowledging where we are and who the enemy is. Because... If you, the first step in any fight back is acknowledging your position. And too many Americans are blind to what we see, are living in fantasy land, living in la-la land, don't understand we're on the verge of losing this country and are not willing to face reality. When we face reality, I don't know any of your spiritual beliefs. I don't know if you have them. I'm not... I don't know what religion you come to, but here's, a, I think, something common to everybody. Courage depends on faith. If you have faith in yourself, if you have faith in a God, if you have faith in your leadership, faith in your society, you have courage. You'll take on anything. We have had the faith driven out of us. We don't have faith in our own abilities. We don't have faith in our institutions. We don't, many of us don't have faith in any higher power. So is it any surprise that there's a big lack of courage out there? That's where we are. And courage comes from facing reality, then digging deep, re-establishing your faith, and then going out to fight. You know, we're, we're a small number, people, but... When did God in the Old Testament ever raise up a large army to smite a small army? Remember any examples of that? Gideon's army versus the horde. David versus Goliath. Your founding fathers, a bunch of farmers and lawyers and blacksmiths with squirrel rifles, 
went up against the world's greatest military empire. Do you think they would have had to have a little bit of faith to do that? Think they'd have to have faith in George Washington, their leadership, faith in their mission, faith in their, in their religion? Do you think they could have done that without faith? So we have to face reality and we have to deepen our faith and we have to have courage beyond limit. Because I believe when we have faith and we stand strong, I think that's when we start to get help. Help from other guys, help from other people, but also spiritual help as well. But we've got to face reality, and we've got to have faith, and we've got to have courage. If we have those things, we can conquer anything. So I'll call it quits there, but I just want to know if there's any questions. Anybody's got anything they'd like to say? Or challenge me, I'm up for a challenge. But don't say anything really aggressive because I might turn into a little quivering wreck. Okay. Yes, sir. I'm just here at MC. Come on up here, man, and ask questions at this mic, please. Questions, comments, pushback, criticisms, swear words, anything. Feel free. Oh, I got plenty of those. Yeah, good. So uh, as a citizen of America, what would you say the best way to combat communism would be at a local level? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we got, I wrote an article for the Epoch Times and I called it a New Zealander's Nine Starter Steps for Saving America from Socialism. And it got 13,000 shares. General Flynn put it out there. So I hope you guys will check it out. But the very first thing I said is face reality. That's, that's it. But on a local level... We have to fortify our states and fortify our counties. If we have a constitutional sheriff, we've got to back them up. We've got to have sheriffs who tell the federal government to take a hike. We've got to have governors like Ron DeSantis, who does tell the federal government to take a hike. So we have to defend him. He's up for election in 2022, and they're going to put everything they can into destroying him. But this is what, this is what I'd say on a personal level. You've got to get yourself right. If you've got anything unethical going on, stop it. If you're in debt, get out of debt. Get yourself right, get lots of food, make sure you've got all the, all the provisions you need. Start forming networks of local people in your communities to help each other in times of need. You know, you know where the mechanic is, know where the farmer is, know what skills you have and how you can network. And then you start working out, you start getting very active in your local community, you start getting active in uh, who you elect to your town councils, your county commissions, and especially your school boards. So there's a lot of school boards in this country where the school board can actually set the curriculum in the school, not the superintendent, not the Department of Education, the school board can. You take over your local school board, you throw out the whole damn curriculum, and you put a Hillsdale College curriculum in, or a, um, or a homeschooling curriculum, in, a traditional curriculum that would have been common in America up to the 1950s. And you start teaching your kids real history and real civics and real math and real science and home economics and shop, wood shop, metal shop, all of that kind of stuff. And I'll tell you what, you get the local real estate agents to fund it because they're going to make so much money selling houses to all the people who want to move into your school district, get their kids into your school. But I think it starts at the first level, you get yourself sorted, you build out from there, you get your little circles who are going to help each other out, uh, you get provisions, you, you, you get all the things you need to survive a bit of a downturn, rough time, then you have to start getting involved in your counties, your county commissions, your state rep races, you've got to make sure that everybody who stands is a patriot. And see, look, I, I go all over this country, I speak to audiences everywhere, and you have never seen the number of people standing up like you see today. It's like the Tea Party movement all over again, but a much younger demographic. You know, because you've got men and women been sitting at home for a year reading their kids' school textbooks, you know, watching their cities burned watching an election stolen in front of their eyes, watching their military being destroyed, 
watching their economy being wrecked. And they're fired up because for the first time in their lives, they realize we could lose this country. And so we got to capitalize on that. We got to all be involved. If you're not involved right now, you got to be involved in every way you can. That's what I would say. Do you want to follow up on that or criticize that? No, I think you summarized it pretty well. Yep. I think, you know, what you guys are doing here, you're building networks here to support each other. Some of you are going through legal battles. Some of you are going through some grief. Well, that's great that you can talk to others and get advice off others, but you've got to build that where you live too. You know, whether you live in Apopka or you live in Tallahassee or wherever you live, you've got to be finding out where your friends are because we are facing some serious crap in this country, folks. Anybody think I'm exaggerating on that one? Yes, well, do you have another question or anybody else have a question? Uh, thank you, Trevor. Thank you. My question is pretty simple. How do we organize as men? Um, a lot of the groups that I'm in, that I've led, that's participated, it seems like it's all inclusive. But there's no parties, there's no groups that pander to Republican, conservative, Christian, uh, heterosexual males. How do we organize as men? Well, yeah, you mean like, well, you got, you're talking about like, say, the Florida Republican assemblies that's women and men, you know? Well, look, you know, there's a time for, the, for women's clubs, there's a time for mixed clubs, there's a time for men's clubs, you know? We shouldn't be embarrassed about that or ashamed that sometimes we just want to hang around with guys, that guys have certain interests. So you've got to find people who are just willing to, to share the space as men and make it very clear that this will be a men's only group. There'll be certain things discussed here that you, that you really want to keep in men's circles and be very overt about that right from the start and not in the least bit embarrassed about it or apologetic for it. Um, you will find, if you start to talk in those terms, you will find a few people who will start to come along and you start to make yourself more public. You know, maybe even have stands at gun shows and things like that, you know. We're, we're a men's group. We want to talk about men's issues. We want to talk about defending our families. We want to talk about defending the country and what we can do to bring masculinity back into its rightful role in society. Just, just got to be bold about it because every most people think this, don't they? Most people think it, but it takes somebody to say it before other people will go, yeah, right, I, I agree with you. So you, you've got a group here that pretty much agrees with most of what you're saying. But I tell you what, I bet you there's another million men in the state who would be very, very, very pleased to meet guys like you, but they probably don't know you exist. All right, thanks, Trevor. Thank you. I just want to thank you for your work, for the oh. crispness and the clarity, the way that you articulate the threat that we're up against. It's, I, I, I don't know that I've heard anyone articulate it so clearly, so thank you so much for that. Well, I appreciate that. And uh, so my first question is, I've got a couple. There seems to be a hardness over people's minds and hearts to really acknowledge the seriousness of this, yeah. the significance of global communism, just how widespread, old, old and organized it is. Yeah. So you articulate things, as I said very clearly, have you found any techniques to get men or even women to acknowledge, okay, maybe there's some reality to this versus just like the willful blindness that everyone seems to be having? Yeah, well, that, that's a very interesting question because, see, when things get really bad, there's two responses. Most people shut their eyes, turn their heads, put their heads in the sand and hope it goes away. That's always been most people. It is a very few who will steel themselves and face up to the reality and start to organize. See, look, in the American Revolution, what, 3% fought in it of the population? 20% right. supported them, 40% supported the British and the rest didn't give a damn. So this is a, a, an old problem. You know, this has been around for a long, this is human nature. But this is why we don't aim to change the mass. 
we aim to develop a few very strong leaders who will never back down regardless. You know, this is, this is the, the hero archetype, you know. The person will just say it like it is. My, well, this is what I say. In the position we're in now, we can only be saved by truth. We can only be saved by truth because it's so gone damn so far and we're faced with fighting on so many fronts that only truth can save us now because truth gives faith and courage. But we got so... I don't go out there trying to convert masses of people. Like my movie, and I, I hope you... That, that is one movie, I will say, that's given... been seen two million times on Amazon Prime, and, and it's... Um, I got a lot of people standing up because of that, because it laid it out very clearly. And we're just doing a new movie now, which is coming out November 2nd, Enemies Within the Church, about the woke Marxist movement in the churches. And I think that will fire up a lot of people. It's, it's, it's just, it's two hours of mic drops. You know, it really is. So, but, the, you know, you've got to make the decision yourself. Am I going to be a collaborator with what's coming? Or am I prepared to risk everything that I have for my God, my country, and my family? That's the decision you make. See, God, God gives us free will. He cannot help us till we have made the decision. When we decide to fight, then it's okay for him to give us some assistance. But he cannot push us. That's why your revolutionaries, I believe, got help. They got provident, providential help. But they had decided to fight the British regardless. They had decided to do that. It was only when the British really decided to fight Hitler that the Yanks came in, you know, that they got help from other quarters. I think it's every, everybody's going to make a decision. We're going to fight for what is right, regardless of what it costs us. And when you do that, you will find people flocking to you from all over the place. But it's that bold leadership, that willingness to tell the truth regardless. Why did people flock to Donald Trump? Because he would say things nobody else dared to say. And I know they weren't all right all the time, <laughs> right. but he was the boldest politician we've seen for a hell of a long time, don't you think? Yep. And they loved him. They just, all across the demographics, um, both genders, everybody just loved Trump because he'd say it like it is. That's why I say only truth can save us now. We've got to use that example be very bold, stand up proudly as men. We're, we're here to lead, we're here to provide, we're here to fight back, we're here to be men. This is the complaint I get when I go to some of these, you've got all these moms standing against critical race theory. The biggest complaint they have is, where's the men and where's the church? That's the biggest, that's the biggest complaint. We've got to be, they're fighting, we've got to be there pushing back as well. And so, and, and because more men have been intimidated than, more, than women have, we are, we are the ones dragging the chain right now. And I think that's why we're just going to be as, as bold as we possibly can be at every, every step of the way. You know, and uh, your wife will love you for it. Well, if she doesn't, you find a new one. <laughs> <laughs> Not married, but I'm working on that. Okay. So well... You'll find, look, there's nothing women like more than a, a man who's willing to say it like it is, you know? For sure. Willing to stand up, because they know he will protect them. Takes them a second sometimes, but yeah. Yeah, it does. Look, look, we might lose our lives standing up. Amen. We could, mm -hmm. but we have to acknowledge that right from the start. Yes, we might lose our business. Yes, we might be kicked out of the uh, social club. Yes, we might be disowned by family members. Yes, we might lose our lives. Yes, we might. But how many of your ancestors were willing to do that so that you may live free now? So where do we get to have a break? Where do we get to enjoy the freedom we have and the great prosperity that was fought and died for? Why do we get to have our generation off? You know, I'm not asking you to go and fight the British. 
I'm asking you to stand up at your city council meeting. I'm asking you to stand up at your school board meeting. I'm going to ask you to go down and talk to the principal when they're teaching your kid crap. I'm asking you to go and set up your own school if you need to. Stand up in every single way you can. Never back down and, and be willing to support everybody else who stands up as well. Take as much of a leadership role as you possibly can. We're all scared of leadership. You know, it's, it's not a comfortable thing. But I bet every one of us can be more leaders than we are today. Every one of us. You're not, well, you might not be the supreme leader, but you can be more of a leader than you are now. And I think that's what you should be looking at in your business life, your family life, your social, you know, your, your civic life, your church life, whatever it is. You go to a church and you've got a wimpy pastor, you sit him aside, you sit him down and talk to him. And if he won't buck up, you find a church that will. Because there's no point going to a meeting like this on a Saturday and going to a socialist church on a Sunday. It ain't going to do you a lot of good. So sort of tagging on to that, I have a second question. Um, regarding the city council meeting and the school boards, there's been a lot of really moving yeah. uh, YouTube videos, yeah. you know, viral videos about men and women getting up and speaking there. But it, it seems to me that institutions, not just the school boards, doctors, you know, all the institutions, politicians, they just don't care. You're talking to a brick wall. The, I mean, the answer is not like, oh, that's a really interesting, thoughtful point. The answer is just no. Yeah. And, and so encountering that, I guess, it's not even really pushback. It's just, I, guess, I don't know what the word yeah, is, it's, apathy. It's, you yeah. know, indifference, that's the word. It's like, you know, it, so you, it's sort of like yelling at the ocean in a way. Yeah. So like, what's the step after that? Because if you're sitting in front of a bunch of impassive faces, like, oh yeah, that's really interesting, and well, you know. Well, what is valuable to them? That's sitting on that scoreboard. They're probably getting $150,000 a year. That's valuable to them. Mm -hmm. And you've got 300 people in your audience asking why they're teaching this crap to your kids. Well, you just say to them, well, we are going to organize a slate the school board meet, elections are coming up next year. There's three positions up. We're going to take every single one of them. You can bank on that. Unless you start doing what we are paying you to do. We're going to do that. And you've got to follow through on that threat. And that is happening all over the country now. People are organizing school board races, school board slates. We're going to see a big change in the culture of that. You know, so... Um, you know, as Ronald Reagan used to say, if they won't see the light, make them feel the heat. <laughs> Look at what they want. They like this little power. They like this fat salary they've got. They're not doing the job. They're actually counterproductive. They're actually hurting your kids. Well, you've got to take them out. You've got to get them off that damn school board. You know, um, there's no, no substitute for executive power. We can moan all out we like but we have to take the positions that make the decisions. And some of those positions have to be eliminated because they shouldn't even be making the decisions. But the ones that are legitimate, we have to decide. Look, we're in the position now because most of us have been too damn lazy for about 100 years now. You know, I've been willing to fight those foreign... You know, with our fathers and uncles, they went out there and they fought the Japanese and they fought the Nazis and they fought the Viet Cong and that and with great bravery but they also let the internal enemies have a free pass yeah. and so they weren't perfect they had, the greatest generation was great but it wasn't perfect and they left us with some thing to mop up well if we love our kids and we, we believe in what we believe in you know we got to take this back and we've got to fight every step of the way. We may not win, but we're all going to be held accountable one day. And this is what I say to myself. I'm going to give it everything I've got because at least I will earn the right to look my children in the eye and say, I did everything I could for you. And one day you're going to stand before your God, people. And you're going to say, you know, you were given this great, wonderful country with a constitution based on the Bible that has done more to spread the gospel than any other, has saved more people from tyranny than any other, created more wealth and riches than any other, and you let it slip away 
without even fighting, and you want to come to heaven. You know, how does that work? You know, we, we are in a position, we've got to fight now, even if we don't think we can win. Like Winston Churchill promised the people, we don't guarantee we're going to beat the Nazis, but we know we've got to fight them. Because that's the right thing to do. Sometimes you have to fight with no hope of victory. Because that's what we are here for, people. And we're going to be held accountable to our families and to God and to ourselves. And I would rather fight like hell and lose than give up and collaborate. And I'd rather fight like hell and win. That's my goal. That's my goal. God bless you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Well, just, just say, we make a decision. You know, we always tell our kids, make the long-term decision. Don't spend all your money now. Save up so you can buy a really nice bike later. We tell our kids, make, sacrifice now so you can do better later. Well, what is the ultimate time frame, folks? What is the longest time frame you can think of? It's eternity, right? If we made every decision based on eternity, would we do things a little different than we do now? Because that's the only time frame to really make decisions on, in my opinion. The only time frame. Yes, sir. All right. Um, first, I want to say I appreciate you calling it for what it is. It's Marxism. Yep. And um, just personal aside, personal point of privilege, 30 years ago, I was in a foreign country. And I just, I can smell them. I, I, I was there, I saw shit I never wanted to relive. And last summer, when I saw what was going on and I, I heard the rhetoric, I recognized this is the same enemy and we're seeing it here. Yeah. It's no longer in the college campuses, it's, it's coming yeah. and it's here. And so uh, I'm one of the many who just packed up and told my boss, find me a new job somewhere. He called me on New Year's weekend and said, there's a day shift in a little tiny town with 7,000 people. I said, picture me knocking over the garbage cans as I skid out of the driveway and text me the directions and off I went. So I got my 100 pounds of beans and I'm ready. Okay. Um, so I appreciate your words. And, yeah. and, and I agree with you. If people don't think that Western civilization is in peril, they're hiding under a rock. Well, look, you cannot deny it any longer. And I'll just to say, you know, you, in that little town, just make sure that you are protecting that town. You're getting in there. You're making sure the school board is sound. You're making the council and the sheriff are going to stand with you when the feds come knocking. Yeah. Um, if, you, if you wouldn't mind, if you, if you could, um, we, we've talked a lot about what to do in our small towns and how to brace ourselves and basically how to fortify here in Fortress America. Can you give us perhaps a little bit of perspective from the outside of our shores, from New Zealand and Australia and out to Europe? Yeah. Because this is not a problem just in America. No. BLM marches were happening around the Western world, yeah. so we know we're dealing with a global enemy. Can you give us a, maybe a broader global perspective? Yeah, well, this, this is what I'd say. Um, you're dealing with global enemies. You're dealing with the Chinese, the Iranians, you're dealing with the Venezuelans and the Cubans. Mexico's got a communist president now. That's why the borders are wide open, guys. So you're dealing with a global enemy that wants world domination, but you've also got friends everywhere. You know, everybody was hanging on that election. You know, I got friends in New Zealand who follow, they follow American politics more than most Americans do. You got people in Australia and France and Germany, they follow American politics and American society way more than most Americans do because they know what happens here is going to either bring them ruin or help them free themselves. So I, I think, I, and I say to people, you know, <laughs> Like the I-4 corridor is one of the most critical parts of America politically. And so I say to the political activists here, I say, you're in the most important area, in the most important state, in the most important country, in the most important time in world history in the last thousand years. 
the fate of, I, don't, I, say, I don't want to lay up a responsibility trip on you, but the fate of Western civilization depends on you here now. Because it does. You know, but these values we're talking about here are common values in most countries. They are the dominant values. And every free country or every semi-free country looks to America as the guiding light. That is the stable, that is the pole that holds the tent up. America is where everybody looks for hope. You may not see that when you're living here, but I'll tell you, you go to Iceland, you'll hear the college, left-wing college students who say they hate America, but you talk to their parents. You talk to the taxi drivers in London, or the, or the butchers in Berlin, or the, you know, the, the, the working people, they know that freedom depends on America and American values. And so they are rooting for you guys. They are rooting for you all over the planet. And if we can recover this country, if we can save this country and turn it around, we're going to spark liberty revolutions and returns to, to common sense all over the world. You know, we're seeing places like Poland and the Czech Republic who are really standing for good values. You know, they're really valuing their families. They're really standing for traditional values. But they all know that they're going to be destroyed if America's destroyed. They know they cannot last. They're doing what they can in their countries, and good for them. But they all know it depends on this country. And so every time there's an election, you know, people are just, you know, rooting for America. That's why, that's why what happened in Afghanistan was such a disaster. Because all your allies in India and Japan and Western Europe got the biggest kick in the guts they've ever had for years. Because they saw an American president betray his own people and betray his own allies. People who'd worked for America for 20 years just left out to be executed by the Taliban. So everybody's thinking, well, why the, you know, the, this is, this, that changed the world balance of power, that did. Not in a good way. So, yeah, what happens here and what you guys do has an impact all over the world. You know, people are looking at this country for hope as a beacon of hope. And if you can save this country and turn it around, you can stand up. That's going to inspire people all over the planet. I, I, I look at things in a pretty dark manner. You know, I can see the bad stuff. But I tell you what, I can see, if we can get through this period now, I can see a, a fantastic future for this planet. Because it's out of the darkest times, that's when you have the greatest victories. You know, Gideon's army, David versus Goliath, the American revolutionaries, Britain under Churchill. The darkest times are where people decide which side they're on. And most people go the wrong way, but a few people go the right way. And they are the people who change history. So I, I am definitely optimistic of where we can go, but that's going to come down to us making the decisions, having faith, and acting in courage, even if it does cost us our lives. Because getting killed ain't the worst thing that can happen to you, folks. Ain't the best, but it sure ain't the worst. And you got, we all got to have that attitude. People say to me, is doing what you're doing dangerous, Trevor? And I say, yeah, but there's one thing more dangerous, and that's not doing it. Anybody else have any questions? I don't know if I've gone over my time or whatever, but I'm, en I'm enjoying this, and I hope you're finding some value in this, you know. Uh, yes, sir. I, I would like to, to, to listen to your comments about uh, your encouragement and your call to action for people who are church goer, go yeah. goers. Yeah. Thank you. Well, well, thank you. You know, because, um, you know, not everybody who's a hero has a spiritual foundation, but most people 
who do heroic things, have a spiritual foundation. Most people who give up alcohol or drugs, they usually do it by finding a spiritual foundation. And when you have a spiritual foundation, that's when you start thinking about the eternal. That's when you start making your decisions a different way. And we're going to be led out of this trouble by the people who do think that way, by the people of faith. And unfortunately, a lot of the people of faith have been out to lunch for the last 50 years, or too many of them have. But I even see that too. I see a big growth in the home church movements, and I see a lot of people really looking like they've never looked before. As I said, sometimes you have to almost lose something before you appreciate what you have. And I think there are millions of people in that position right now. And I think a lot of them are going to make the right decisions. And that's our future friends. That's the kind of people we should be looking to find and looking to nurture and looking to help and have them help us. But anybody else have a comment or a question or um, criticism or abuse? So thank you. What he represents is patriarchy. We're here to do work as men, as patriarchs. There's nothing more natural than being a father. This is Will Spencer from the Renaissance of Men here with the New 21 Report and Trevor Loudon. Trevor, welcome. Hey, good, good to talk to you, Will. Thank you. Good to talk to you, too. Thanks for coming out to the 21 Convention. What was the, uh, what was, I heard some of your talk at 21 Patriarchs event. What was the subject matter of the talk? Well, I was talking about Marxism and, and that what we're really seeing in America now is a revolutionary process. And, and this is a men's conference. Um, and what we're seeing is a war on men. We're seeing war on hierarchy. We're seeing more, a war on the patriarchy. The feminist movement is, is, is Marxist at root. The LGBTQ movement is Marxist at root. And the point I wanted to make is we can't see these phenomena as separate. They're all manifestations of Marxism. Um, the attack on men, the attack on masculinity is part of a basically a revolutionary plan to overturn this country. Mm -hmm. Did you find that the men understood or resonated with the message? Yeah, I think largely they did. You know, they, they, they might have a, a specific thing that, that they are looking at, mm -hmm. but I think when I brought it into, you know, connected a few of the dots, I think they could see, yeah, this, this goes beyond mere accident mm -hmm. and that these things are, are linked, you know. Like, like Marxism is a revolutionary process. You know, we're, we're given, it's, it's overturning all the natural hierarchies of life. You know, you know, Western culture was, good, you know, supported for many years by the church, by the family and civil government. All of those institutions are under massive attack. Mm -hmm. So the war on men is part of a wider war on, on Western civilization. Mm -hmm. What are some of the strongest piece of, pieces of evidence that you show men to show them that there's more going on here beneath the surface than, you know, may meet the eye, let's say? Yeah, well, I, like in my books and my movies, I'm just doing a movie right now called Enemies Within the Church. Mm -hmm. And we, we deal there with the communist origins of the homosexual rights movement, the LGBTQ movement. Mm -hmm. You know, Harry Hay, Communist Party member, was the first gay rights activist. Um, groups like ACT UP and others, all Marxist groups, you know, the, the feminist groups, the abortion movement, you can trace it all back to the Communist Party USA, the Socialist Workers Party, etc. So we can, we can point out very clearly the Marxist origins of these movements and the Marxist leaders of these movements even today. Um, you know, the L, the the, tra the transgender movement and the, it, it's, that's common now in the schools and colleges, you can, you can show the Marxists involved in this. You can show the Marxist writings about it. It's all a deconstruction of Western society, the hierarchies that we hold as normal. It's all part of the wider revolutionary process.
Where did this deconstruction come from? I know some of the names. I know you mentioned some of mentioned some of them in your talk, but maybe you can share some of them here. Well, you know, the the communist movement. You know, the the big mistake that most people see is they see the communist movement or the Marxist movement as an economic thing. It's all about the workers rising up and taking the wealth of the bosses, but that's only a very small part of this. Mm -hmm. So you know, Karl Marx was was someone who really championed this. Um, but then you had Marcuse, who brought it more into the social constructs. You know, that this is about this, the genders as well, the war of the sexes, that the feminists will rise up and take away the power of the patriarchy. You can see it in the gay movement with Harry Hay, who, who elevated homosexuality as, as being superior to, to heterosexuality. You know, this was a war on the family. You know, the Betty Friedans of the world, the... Gloria Steinem's, all of these women who elevated, you know, brought the feminist movement forward, Emmeline Pankhurst, all Marxist, all Communist Party members, all members of Democratic Socialists of America, all of these movements you can trace back to Marxism and Marxism as an attempt to overturn the social structures of society to replace it with a socialist communist society. And so when we look at men's issues, we look at the corruption in the legal system that, that, that you know, gives men an unequal deal. When we look at the elevation of the LGBTQ movement, the transgender movement, we have to understand them as part of a revolutionary process. Mm -hmm. And we cannot deal with them if we just think they're just crazy people doing crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. This is Marxist-directed, um, still involved with China, still involved with Russia, still involved with hostile foreign powers, using social movements in this country to destroy this country so that China, Russia, etc., can basically run the planet mm -hmm. according to their standards. So all these movements are coordinated. Hmm. But it seems like when you try to explain this to people, not you, you, but the or you or when I or when many yeah, try to sure. explain this to people, they say, oh, no, it's just... Coincidence or incompetence. Yeah. Those are the two main. What do you say to that? Well, look, you know, if it was just incompetence, wouldn't people make mistakes in our favor once in a while? You know, the classic example right now is, is, is the disaster in Afghanistan. Right. You know, this was just incompetence. How could anybody be so stupid as to withdraw the military while you still had civilians on the ground, while you still had a big air base? full of billions of dollars worth of material, how could anybody be so stupid? Well, it's stupid to think that is stupidity. You know, these, these are clever people running the United States. Not saying Biden's clever, I'm saying the people behind him, the Susan Rices, the Barack Obamas, Xi Jinping. This was a deliberate policy by the US government at the behest of China to basically turn over to, to basically turn over all this material to China's friends and America's enemies. Now, it, now the, most of the West's allies look at America and think, how the heck can we ever trust America again? We better start making other agreements. So that, that incident in Afghanistan changed the world balance of power. It also helped China another way because China wants to invade the Pacific but it had this American base on its western flank. And that would have meant they'd have to fight a two-front war. Well, now they don't have to fight a two-front war. They can use, they, it's freed them up to attack the Pacific. So what I, what I say to people is this. There is evil in the world. There is malevolence. There's always been statists and dictators and socialists and fascists and communists who want to change everything about everything, you destroy the West. And because the West is based on Christian principles, it's based on constitutionality, it's based on rule of law, and it's based on all these things that dictators hate. So don't you think Xi Jinping would want to overturn that? Don't you think Vladimir Putin would want to overturn that? Don't you think, and don't you think they have agents in this country who are working to their benefit? You know, we, we have ignored internal security in this country for 50 years now, 
and that's we are seeing the results of that. Oh, absolutely. This is 2021 right now, and I think yeah. to me, I feel like it's undeniable that many of the things that you're saying are are true. Yeah, and you must receive a lot of pushback for saying these things. No, that can't possibly be real. Well, you do, but but look, I I, I produce documentaries. I produce. We've got a new one coming out, Enemies Within the Church, which will rock American Christianity, I believe. Mm. But you know, I have documentaries on Black Lives Matter, how they're basically an operation of the Chinese Communist Party, mm. and I can prove this. Mm. Uh, but you still have big corporations giving these people money. You still have churches taking a knee to these people. You still have people saying, well, this is just an anti-racism movement. No, it is a communist Chinese directed movement to burn American cities, create maximum racial division, and bring this country to its knees. You know, when I say these things, I can give you the documentary evidence to back them up. I can show you the words from their own words. You know, I can I can show you the people who organized the rioting in Minneapolis talking about the joy they felt when Precinct 3 was burnt to the ground, how the rioting, the looting, and the arson was an integral part of their movement, in their own words, saying this on tape. Mm -hmm. Have you been engaging with the speakers, or sorry, the men, the attendees, or have they been mm -hmm. engaging with you outside of the sessions? Have you been having conversations well, with them? Well, in? as much as possible, I've had to go away to deal with other engagements. But yeah, um, and I found it very stimulating, I have to say. You know, everybody's got a slightly different angle on these problems. But I think the perspective I have is I can unify them a little bit more. Each of these problems is not separate. Each of these problems is a result of a program. Mm -hmm. But so I've, uh, but I've deepened my understanding of several aspects of it mm -hmm. by talking to the, to the people at this conference. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, that's what that's what makes it worthwhile coming here for me. Can you share one of the subjects you've uh, gained a deeper appreciation of? Well, um, there's a I just can't remember his last name. Greg talked. Coach talk, Greg Adams. Coach Greg Adams talked a lot about the sort of common things. You know, happy wife, happy life. You know, and talked about how if we have if men have problems with women, it's because men have allowed that to happen. It's allowed. The feminist myths, it's because we ourselves have bought into these feminine myths and we don't challenge them, we don't set the ground rules with the women in our lives. And therefore, the, femi the, 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 the feminist Marxism intrudes into our relationships. And that was an insight to me, yeah. Yeah, it, if we have a problem, it's because we've allowed that problem to be there. You know, Marxists do what Marxists do. Tyrants do what tyrants do. Radicals do what radicals do. They affect us to the degree that we allow them to affect us, to the degree that we don't say no, to the degree that we don't set boundaries. So, yeah, there was, a, there was some good insights there for me personally. Have you spent any time in the 22 convention room or talked to any of the women attendees? No, I haven't. I've... I've I had to leave the convention to go and attend to a, an other business, so I wasn't here for most of that time. Do you find that women engage with you on these topics as much as men do, less so, maybe even more? Yeah, well, in this particular, you know, I, I, I'm not normally talking about the relationship between the sexes, and, and uh, I'm more talking to political groups about Marxist infiltration, that kind of thing. But I do... I have been bringing those aspects more into a lot of the, the talks I do to churches because I think one of the big problems in the churches is a big misunderstanding of what love is. You know, most churches are all about love. Love, 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 love. It's the most common word. But it's all the feminine side of love. It's all we will nurture you, we'll help you, we'll expect you. It's not the masculine side of love who will call you to account, who will hold you to judgment. And when I talk about the value of masculine love in the churches, I get a lot of women come up to me and say, yeah, right on. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I talk about, you know, the feminine love is, is the mother who will pick you up, who will bandage your knee, who will um, accept you or bake cookies with you and, and just be a mother. You know, just what it, we all crave that. But there's the love of the father who will boot your little backside if you disrespect your mother, mm -hmm. who will 
take, take, you to, take you to the ball game, take you fishing, to the woodshed if necessary. You know, he'll teach his son to be a man and his daughter to be a lady. And that has been driven out of the churches and largely driven out of Western society. So when I speak about those issues, which I have been more in recent times, yeah, a lot of women engage with me on that. They, they, they say hallelujah. They you see know? the lack of masculinity and they see you talking about it. Yeah, look, look, it, it's men have got to be men. You know, we, we, are, we have roles. And when a man has been a man and a woman's been a woman, it's complementary. And the children, are, you know, you produce something that's greater than the sum of the parts. The whole is greater than the sum of the parts. It's, but when a man is not being a man, a woman can't really be a woman. So they feel cheated. Men are not living to their full potential, and the children have to suffer the consequences. And so, you know, I'm encouraged, you know, men have got to stand up. It's, you know, cur- and it's, it's a lack of courage, and courage becomes is because of a lack of faith. You, you have a lack of faith in your own masculinity. You don't understand, you have been told continuously that men are toxic, that masculinity is toxic. So you, you don't have faith, you don't have certainty in your own role, and therefore you have less courage. You know, I, I, a lot of women are out there right now fighting against critical race theory in the schools, which is just a, a racialized form of Marxism. And the big complaint they have that I see all the time is where are the men and where are the churches? We're fighting this all by ourselves. You know, we need the men to be fighting there in the trenches too. They're the dads, they're half of the family. You know, they've got to be there too. So, yeah, I do, a lot of women do, when I speak like this, a lot of women go, yeah, right on. Um, it's great to see a man boldly saying these kind of things, talking about hierarchy, talking about patriarchy. Um, and they appreciate it. They really, really do. Did that surprise you? Yeah, a little bit, you know, a little <laughs> bit. But, um, you know, I buy some of the feminist myths too, you know. But, um, and just when I mentioned the hi- hierarchy, you know, hierarchy is something we should glorify. Hierarchy is something we should appreciate. Even Jordan Peterson, who I really appreciate, is really very good. He doesn't get hierarchy. Mm. He's always talking about how we've got to flatten the hierarchy and hierarchy can be a bad thing. Yeah, hierarchy can be a bad thing as anything, but we cannot live without hierarchy. You know, God, man, nature, that's a hierarchy. You know, boss, worker, master, apprentice, father, mother, children, they are hierarchies. And when we try and screw around with those hierarchies or ignore those hierarchies, we're, 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 we're part of the revolution because the revolution, the Marxist revolution, the revolution is about overturning the natural hierarchies of life and replacing them with unnatural hierarchies. We will never get rid of a hierarchy. Mm-hmm. It's either a natural hierarchy, a good hierarchy, or it's a bad feminist, Marxist type of hierarchy. You know, right, right now we're, we're being told that nature is superior to man that we, man is a cancer on the earth and we've got to reduce our population. We've got to, you know, get rid of global warming and all that. This is all garbage. Man is placed above nature. Nature is here for our benefit. And when we buy into, so we don't get rid of hierarchy when we say that, you know, we just, they they put nature above us, you know, um, you know, so so respecting hierarchy, but the right hierarchies is a very, very important thing of what we need to do to, to right our society. Mm-hmm. Because the revolutionaries have been out there trying to destroy our hierarchies for a hundred years, mm-hmm. trying to overturn everything that we hold dear, overturn the family, overturn civil government, overturn the church. And if we allow them to happen, we are, we are, we are heading for a world of chaos. Why the hundred year figure specifically? Like, does that refer to a, a particular date or a particular event? Some men will trace the beginning of the real decline to the 1960s, the sexual revolution. Oh, it's way before that. It was before that, but you know, yeah. this sort of many men pick different dates. Why did yeah. you uh, choose a hundred years ago? The Bolshevik Revolution. Uh, okay. You know, 
Because, look, we've always had, you know, as right back to the days of Adam, we've had people trying to bring down, overturn the hierarchy, you know, overturn the natural hierarchies. Um, Karl Marx made a little bit of a science of it. Mm -hmm. The feminist movement, which was a Marxist movement, came along in the late 1890s. Uh, it got really beefed up after the Bolshevik Revolution. After you had the Bolshevik Revolution, all of these things then had state backing. Mm. You had the Soviet Union funding. You know, they would clamp down on homosexuality at home because they wanted to keep their system together. They would clamp down on feminism at home because they wanted to keep their social structures intact. But they funded all these movements in the West. They... they wrote books, that they, they funded authors who wrote books. They directly funded communist parties and communist movements. Mm -hmm. So it went into overdrive in the early 1920s because that's by, by then the Bolshevik revolution had consolidated itself and was starting to fund revolutionary activity all around the world. Mm. America almost had a communist revolution in 1922. Mm. People don't un people don't have have not understood that. I do, I'm one of them. Yeah, well look look they they were very worried. They they had to deport something like 10,000 foreign revolutionaries after the Parma raids of 1921-22. Wow. Yeah. They they sent them back to Eastern Europe because we were having bombings, we were having mass strikes. There was a real danger in the early 20s we were going to have a Bolshevik revolution in America. And they, they pushed it back at that time. But it got a foothold in Hollywood. It got a foothold in the churches. It got a foothold in the feminist movement. It got a foothold in the LGBT, the, the gay movement through Harry Hay and people like that. So what we're seeing in America right now is the fruits of the Bolshevik revolution. You know, it is still we're still feeling effects, and now it's largely run by China and Cuba. But Russia's still in there. Russia's still doing it. Putin is all, I'm a man, you're a woman, you know, we support uh, the Christianity and all this kind of thing. It's all BS. He supports it at home, but over here he's still funding the, the bad stuff. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of a lot of people have heard that Russia's sort of been a bad guy in the global stage and meanwhile been ignoring China at the same time, at least at home. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it sounds like maybe Russia might be as significant a player as China in some ways. Look, it is. You know, Russia still provides a lot of the ideological, you know, framework of this kind of stuff. Russia still has the nukes. You know, we say China is the leader of the world communist movement right now, but Russia's got the nukes. Mm -hmm. And he who holds the nukes really holds the key to power. Mm -hmm. You know, Russia could still annihilate China tomorrow if it wanted to. Russia could annihilate this country probably if it wanted to. So don't get sucked in to the Russian propaganda that Russia is all pro-family, Russia is all um, pro-Christian. They do that to neutralize the conservatives in this country. Mm -hmm. But they are still funding Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. They are still working with Cuba. They're still working with China. They're still working with Iran. Their goal is to bring down the United States of America because if you can bring down the United States, you rule the world. No one stands against you at that point. No, no one stands against you. Talk about the role of Donald Trump both as an American president and uh, perhaps also in the men's movement if you see it that way. Yeah, I think Ronald, Donald Trump was very positive. You know, he, he's a man, he's a guy, very strong masculine values, very courteous to women, you know, but he's a man. He's an alpha male who says it's all right to be an alpha male. It's all right to make America great, to, to not apologize for America's greatness, to be proud of America's greatness. And I thought he did the men's movement. I thought he did America a lot of favors. Mm -hmm. Women, you know. Gosh, you know, half his fan base is raving, crazy women who just love him like a chocolate, you know. You know, and we hear about these women who are really, really turned off by Trump. Yeah, a few were, a few were like that, but a lot of women just loved him. And men, young, young men, Latino men, black men, he was unashamed masculinity, unashamed America first, unashamed America, you know, masculine love. There's no doubt Donald Trump loves America. There's no doubt Donald Trump loves his family. There's no doubt he's a man and he knows his place, you know, and, and, and the thing. And uh, 
he just destroyed this myth of toxic masculinity. Mm -hmm. People thought, well, I can get a job now because of him. My kids can get jobs. My soldier, my, my, my husband who's in the military can be proud of being in the military again. You know, he's defending America. He's defending something worthwhile. So I would say the biggest masculine heroes for some time would be Jordan Peterson and Donald Trump. Mm. I think those two guys have done more good for men and women than, than just about anybody else you could name in the last 50 years. I, wholeheart I wholeheartedly agree. Mm. Where can men go to find out more about you and what you do? Yeah, go to trevorloudon.com. Um, uh, you, you've got to, you can't Google that because Google's forgotten my IP address. You just put it in the search bar. But please, we're releasing a new movie on November 2nd, Enemies Within the Church. Now, it's going to deal a lot with the feminization of the churches, the Marxist influence of the churches. But whether you're Christian, whether you're atheist, whether you're Jewish, whether you're Hindu, whether you're Muslim, whatever, that movie will reaffirm masculinity in a big way, and I urge everybody to see it. It's two hours of mic drops, mm. two hours of just hardcore truth, um, calling out error, calling out, calling out the, 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 just the, the, the malign influences that we're seeing in this country. Many of them manifested through the churches and caused by the church's abandoned, aband, abandonment abandonment of masculinity and leadership. But uh, if you want to see my work, go to Enemies Within the Church. That's enemieswithinthechurch.com. Mm -hmm. that, that will show you more than anything else. Thank you so much for your brave work, sir. Pleasure, Will. Pleasure to sit with you. Great to be here. Thank you, sir. This is Will Spencer with the Renaissance of Men here with the New 21 Report and Trevor Loudon. Thanks so much. Thank you.